kindness conference today. We would like to welcome you into this space and with your permission, we would love to share some stories and some songs with you. Some that we've collaborated together and uh, rejigged and reimagined some words and songs by Carl and Sarah, thank you, and Seraphine. Um, but first up this evening, I would like to welcome, if you put your hands together, please, Mr. George Dan. set fire to my feet. Okay, well welcome everyone. It's really nice uh, to see you all. Um, okay, I'm going to uh, do a couple of kind of short stories really. Um, but a little bit of Audience interaction, first of all, please, as everyone leaves immediately. Um, who here remembers Jack and Ori? Do you remember Jack? Do you have hands up. Jack and Ori? Jack and Ori. Yeah. Okay, that's great, that's great. Right, um, the children's BBC television series, which was originally broadcast between 1965 and 1996 with around three and a half thousand episodes in its 31 year run. The show's format, which you probably remember, changed very little during those 30 years. And you remember, Monday to Friday, 15 minutes. And uh, it was usually a single book that was covered in that Monday to Friday period. It, 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 probably, it was read by an actor, a famous actor, wasn't it, generally. And they were sitting in an armchair. Now, why was it called Jack and Ori? Anybody? Why it was it called Jack and Ori? Okay, right. Um, okay, well, um, the show's title came from an old English nursery rhyme. I'll tell you a story about Jack and Ori. And now my story's begun, I'll tell you another of Jack and his brother. And now my story is done. That rhyme was first recorded in the publication, The Talk Book for All for little masters and misses, which appeared about 1760. So I've not got an armchair, um, but I'm gonna tell you a story too, and it's called The Pilgrimage. And it's, um, this is the text of a speech given in the year 2050, 2050, by a St. Ives tourist guide, perhaps by then, a 90-year-old Shanti Baba, if anybody knows anything about tour guides in, 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 Penza, in, in St. Ives. As he stood on Back Road West next to Norway Square. Does anyone know of Norway Square? I know Graham does. Does anyone else know Norway yeah, Square? I just came there. I saw you there a few weeks ago. Oh gosh, I, I, well, I didn't say this. I promise I didn't do this one. <laughs> okay. um, right, well it seemed a rather nondescript location. With the space now filled by a car park, only big enough for two medium-sized vehicles at most, but which the council said would help bring in tourists and thus aid the local economy. On a wall of one of the houses adjacent to the car park was a small blue plaque on which were written these words, Norway Square used by poets, storytellers, singers and musicians from 1985 to 2025, led by Bob Devereaux, and in brackets it said elsewhere of wet. They came from far and near, some it is said even from the North Country, by car, train, bicycle and foot. And of course, the locals also arrived from across the moorlands of Penwith to this special place in September each year. And they brought their stories, their songs, their poems and musical instruments. And some of them also brought their dogs. Of that, we have documentary evidence. But as you know, as stories are told over the decades, they are sometimes exaggerated. So that some say that they also brought cats, horses, and the occasional parrot. Can you believe that? And I have heard that someone once brought a cow. 
but that I can't be certain. And it's said that some of these folk, who also met with each other at times between these large gatherings, but for the majority, that was only in September that they were able to come to this special place. And what was this place? And what was so special about it? For I have heard that it was almost a holy place where they celebrated a kind of shared communion and a deep immersion in the arts of poetry, song, song and storytelling. The place was not a palace, but rather an untidy space of cobblestones and cracked uneven paving. A couple of benches, some old chairs which had to be put, put out and taken away and had seen better days and surrounded by a low-level wall of perennial plants. But it was special. And let us not forget the laughter. Yes, it is said that there was always the laughter. And that it was a special kind of laughter, not, it seems, the sort of knowing laughter so prevalent these days in TV, radio, newspapers, and the many varieties of social media. Not that clever, mocking, judgmental laughter. No, this was a laughter that was always positive, affirming, shared, and almost childlike in its innocence. But it was not naive. Oh no, I would not call it that. As in many cases, it was also learned and wise. More than anything, I would call it compassionate. Does that sound strange? compassionate laughter and it was so beautiful as to be sometimes painful the sort of pain which comes when your heart is pierced and it was so beautiful yeah and and that piercing that piercing of the heart experienced by many i understand was not only caused by the fun they all shared but also by the occasional sadness brought to the fore, say, by a word or a line of a poem. And this piercing of the heart opened up a crack in that organ, which for many had remained closed for so much of the year. And it's said that each afternoon, when they returned to their temporary accommodation, houses, flats and tents, some would shed a tear of sadness too. Did I mention that this was a sacred, a holy place? If that is the case, then it would not be inappropriate to describe their journeys as some sort of pilgrimage, a homecoming of some sort. A question arose from one of the assembled crowd. How did this place come about? It is written that a man called Bob, for that was his name, was at the centre, a painter and a poet. It was his idea, and indeed he had led each daily gathering. And another question. So what was he like? I understand that physically he was a colossus, huge and with long flowing hair. And in reciting his poems from memory, he would occasionally make sudden, strange loud noises which caused dogs to howl and perhaps cats to meow and horses to neigh. His poems, which would sometimes last for as long as 15 minutes, could involve him running around the place, surprising passers-by and the occasional seagull. And he was known for his kindness his wisdom and encouragement to fellow performers and for the twinkle which was never far away from his eyes. It was a sad day for many when the decision was made to turn the square into a car park. Letters were written to the council in the St Ives Times and Echo and a petition was quickly drawn up. Past pilgrims brought their children and grandchildren from far and wide to show them this place 
where a kind of magic had been performed each year for 40 years so that they would remember it as it had been before the tarmac was laid. Protesters would gather each day, carrying placards and singing songs and reciting their poetry. It's reported that the song Morris Room was their, were their anthem. But in the end, it was to no avail. And that is why we now call, we now see before us two nondescript family cars. This is, however, not the end of the story. It is said that for two weeks each September, if you come here in the middle of the night and be perfectly still and silent and listen very, very carefully, you can hear the gentle, ethereal lilt of pilgrims laughing and the sound of song in the chorus of Morris Room, which went like this. You might remember from being here. In the Morris on Gwek Room together, in the lamplight on the sofa, we made such a charming picture, we should stay this way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, stand up for this one. Get your sketchbook. Got your sketchbook. I'm not going to show you my sketches. Um, okay, we're going to stay with St. Ives. Sorry, Penzance folk. This is St. Ives. This is like Rangers and Celtic, isn't it? And Liverpool and it. I don't know. Anyway, right, this is the last one in St. Ives. Um, in 2017, um, I went to a workshop called To Paint. No, hold on, that's the title of this. Called uh, The Confident Painter. And uh, it was in the Mariner's Gallery, quite close to Norway Square. On the 11th of September, 2017. Um, okay, so afterwards I wrote this. It's called To Paint, Perchance to Dream. I can't make art. I'm not an artist. I think I can make art. I think I can be an artist. I want to make art. I want to be an artist. I will. I will make art. I will be an artist. I am making art. I am being an artist. And this is art. Oh, sketch. I'm an artist. I can't make art. I'm not an artist. I was rubbish at art at school. I really envied the arty types. They all seemed to be into the stones, jazz and the blues. And their clothes, so lazily thrown together. They're so cool. Maybe it was just about envying them. Maybe it wasn't about the art. Yes, I think that's it. The actual art, what they produced, I don't remember any of that. But I do recall the look and the scene, so seductive. But I just didn't know the language, the way in. I think I can make art. I think I can be an artist. Over the past six years, I've written lots of songs and a few poems and plays. I made music with my guitar, harmonica and djembe drum. I've been in a band. I'm still in a band. We do gigs. We have fun. So is that not enough? Why is it so important to paint? Can't I just be satisfied with what I have, with what I do? Am I being precious and selfish? Should I just get a grip? Take stock of what I've got, leave the visual stuff to the experts, yeah. But who's an expert? I want to make art, I want to be an artist. Sometimes words and music just aren't enough. I mean, they're great, but sometimes they're just not enough. I went to see the Dylan art exhibition. This is back in 2017. 
massive landscapes of empty roads and deserts, Mexican bars and New Jersey fairgrounds, untidy splashes of colour, yes, but why does he need to paint for goodness sake? And his paintings are pretty rough, they're not that great, technically, whatever that means. I'm not Dylan, but maybe I could have a go. What have we got to lose? And then, I meet Fred. Fred's 92. He's an ex-sailor and blacksmith. He would say, if pressed, that his claim to fame was repairing the arrow on the statue of Piccadilly Circus after it was damaged during the war. But in my eyes, he has a bigger claim to fame. You see, Fred is one of the most beautiful men I have ever met. He's so kind and loving and he paints and paints. We talk endlessly about art and he shows me his latest struggle and trying to copy a detail from Vermeer's girl with a pearl earring. And he has a daughter in St Ives. And he comes to St Ives sometimes. And he gives me a drawing of the Daiji, which I pin up in my house. Fred says, I should paint. I will make art, I will be an artist. Right, let's do it. Straight after seeing the Giorgio O'Keefe exhibition at the Tate, I head for the shop and come out with a bag full of brushes, watercolour paints, introductory books, sketch pads, pencils and even a rubber and a pencil sharpener with the word Tate in big letters all over that. I watch countless YouTube films on painting. I'm really going to do this thing. After a year, I still haven't taken anything out of the bag. What's going on? I make my annual visit to St Ives. Last year I attended two classes at the School of Painting, Sensory Landscapes and Sketch and Scroll. This year, an intro to watercolours, but before then, a session on the aforementioned confident painter. For budding artists who have little or no confidence and just can't get going. Fred would have been so pleased with that. I am making art, I'm being an artist. I started to scratch the sketch. It's not good. It's hard work. But maybe we practice. Fred dies this summer. And I don't get around to showing him anything I've done. I feel I've let him down. Since then, I've come across several local folk who paint. This is in South London. Okay, sure. There really are lots of painters around. I have another look at what I've drawn. It's a start. I can go on. So maybe I am making art and just not aware of it. It strikes me that if I'm not making my work, then nobody is. Maybe I am being an artist. Maybe one day I'll convince myself that This is art, and I'm an artist. Maybe one day. Thanks very much. So, um, it's Carl and Serafina mix. And um, yeah, Carl's, Carl's, this is Carl's you know, ideas that are all coming to the fore here. And it's just been a huge pleasure and working with both of them actually and with Keith too. It's been great. Um so do you want to what we can we're doing together, shall I just talk a, a little bit about the donations and stuff like that? There is anything okay, anything anything that's you know paid, your ticket money basically, after any cost, it's going to go to a charity. What's left is going to charity. It used to be called Ad um, Ad Action which I think is now called With You in Penzance, and it's to help um, um, people who have problems with drugs and alcohol. So that's what we'll be giving anything over and above the cost to us. So I just thought I'd let you know. If you wanted to give any more, there's a little box which is virtually hidden over there where you can put anything in there. But, um, but you know, it's enough that you've come, so we're really 
more than delighted with that. So with that, I'm going to hand you over to Carl and Serafina. We're still debating it. I think he should do this song. He thinks I should do it. <laughs> you should do it, Carl. It's your song. Go on, Carl. Yeah, it's your song. Yeah, see? See? Go on, Carl. You can do it. You can do it. I've got plenty of singing later. Kiss me, love me, and you shall be as soon as you are. Kiss me.
praying the same thing, it's not the same as this. Yeah, my name is Peter James Norman. I uh, go by the monograph Tessa Mangai. And everybody keeps asking, what does Tessa Mangai mean? What does Tessa Mangai mean? It means five. That's all it means is the number five. It's uh, come up many times in my life and has become some sort of strange little thing that seems to be following me around. So uh, it's an Inuit dialect. Dead doesn't exist anymore. So I've decided to look on Google and try and find the most complex way to say the number five. That's it. Tessa Mangai. <laughs> that's, the, that's the most complex way to say it. So. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I feel it when I try to connect. Plugged in, baby, but all I feel is regret. Every time I try to witness the world in motion that floats and washed up from the electronic ocean. The notion of being aware and awoken when your life is filtered through a search engine's motions. It's flickering eyelids of binary bits. Seeing but not knowing whether it's Right or wrong? Right or wrong? It dances to a beat, but it can't sing the song. It doesn't know who it's by. It will never know whether to laugh or whether to cry. It just consumes you in ones and zeros. It decides who will be your heroes. And who will be your villains. And who will be on your mind when you kiss your child's sleep? Who dances in your cortex and plays counter rhythms to your beat? Make a figure, make a monster, and make them hate it. Make them a hero to another, and then you've got the bait set. You just pour a little fuel and then you've got yourself a fire. People bearing crosses shouting down the others like their lives. There's false information and news that ignores all of the facts and a media tunnel that's narrowed by ignoring caveats. There's a craving, you know, <laughs> just for knowing. But really it's just hoping other people feel like you. That the stuff that you have experienced and assimilated into yourself will lead you and them to noble truths. Now, you're not alone. And that no man, woman, or child is an island. But the problem is, we're all drowning from where I stand. So I paddled to the shore, tired of standing in the water, of this septic sewage of hate and slaughter. I'll be ignorant of all the things I should be aware of. I can do one thing. It's very simple. And that is be a well of love. All that come to me, I will give a prayer and ask the universe for blessings. And those near and my loved ones, I will offer hope and try and reapply the dressings. There's no way I'm able to be a saviour of an entire people. But I can worship at the church of my loved ones and wonder at their steam. The creation they have made of themselves. This wonderful edifice. And we can dance and laugh and cry and feast. And if you like, we'll shake a few fists. But I'm shutting down the computer now. Time to sever the electronic umbilical cord. We are all going to share with you tonight our few chosen words. It's time to break, break free, sit back and unwind, searching for the answers you know are somewhere inside your mind. You can't find them because you've been clicking and liking online. I bid you don't do it so much. It's soul-destroying emptiness. 
time after time. Not to be wished away 
by counting the measure. Time goes by and it can slowly tick, but only if you treasure it. Time goes by and it can slowly tick, but only if you treasure it. Time goes by and it can slowly tick, but only if you treasure it. Time goes by and it can slowly tick, but only if you treasure it. Time goes by and it can slowly tick, but only if you treasure it. Time goes by and it can slowly tick, but only if you treasure it. Time goes by and it can slowly tick.
Yeah, I've had three already, I think, so um, I have to lie down. Um, so, uh, second half, and um, introduce again, he, uh, ambient point and musician. One day in February in the lockdown, with the very unpredictable weather that we had at that time, I decided it would be a really good idea to go to City and Slake and decide to walk round City and Slake with my friend. We'd never walk round City and Slake. We did not know how far it would take. We looked on Google Maps. Oh, two hours. Two hours Google Maps said to walk round City and Slake. I think if you ran very fast, you might get round it in three. Um, on the day that we went, as it was knee deep with mud, the paths were ruined. And this is a little poem about getting there and going round and being very cold. Cool, crisp wind bites frail, feeling fingers, and even when the bike engine stops, that cool sting lingers. Leather flesh to protect mine, my frail pink covering, on a pale blue morning as I ride. By the wind-rippled lake, I stop and watch the sky stream pass. Roiling clouds roll by, and I take digital memories through electronic eyes. Just in case I forget. Just in case I forget. Take to our feet, and we're wrapped up well, but we were not to know. Who could tell? That the heavens would open upon us, and pregnant black clouds birthing shells. On, off, on, off, on again as we walked for hours. Round that lake with the wind-whipped peaks of water, storms, a whirling fury gave us no quarter. Lost in the middle of everywhere, but so far from home. I longed to be back there, that place where I'm from. We gave ourselves to this day, and what did it give us? Damp feet from trudging through the mud and the slush. Sinking, squelching, as we looked upon the lake reflecting the sky. And still those clouds roll and roll by. Try and try as we might, there seemed no end in sight, and the path decayed and degraded, an eclipse of where we started. And we knew we'd made it. Rosy cheeked and limbs fit to seize, nose runs red, bless you please. I make it back, but I'm frozen to the bone, to the little house up the big hill. Oh, the little one's already tucked up in bed. What all zeds snoozing from my little head. My lover there to cradle my ice limbs. To run hot baths, make tea and other things. Wrapped in this love, I could ask for nothing. To think of all that time I was looking for something. Self-inflicting my suffering, but for joy today. Pat ourselves on the back. You know what? We did okay. I promise myself next time I'll be far more wary as we made it round that lake in late February. Thank you. Somewhere among this collection of neurons and mine and yours and the particles that spin, something that connects us all. I'm not religious, but I've seen a miracle. Something beyond the physical, the empirical, the measured and the recorded. And it's worth its weight in gold, but it's not Nobel Prize rewarded. These are leaps of faith, not calculated mistakes. The science is instinctual, not calculated or clinical, physical in part, but mostly by heart and then by head you're led to the light, like a moth. But not to be pinned down and then dissected, but to fly free and not be infected, like the rabbit waiting for its test injection. It's more like that milliliter of mercury waiting for magnetic connection. You slip seamlessly 
becoming one in the space of a breath. Inhale that split second and you've completed the test. And chemistry comes when you found it. And it all lines up in a synchronous orbit. And you're not the centre, but you're just part of the majesty, the celestial bodies of people surrounding you. The particles spin off and then they'll join again. New bonds form and form a new chain, a spiral arm reaching forever. But not in the stars. It's connecting each other. Me, you, my sisters, my brothers. We are grown from Gaia, the mother of all mothers. And that's all we know. And we stop at a certain point because knowledge is not exponential. And there are questions that will go unanswered. But I find that wonderfully understandable. And now I know I need not die to look upon the face of God. Because he's here, in each of you, in this space, with what we all have got. Thank you. Uh, now, this, uh, like I said, we've been collaborating on stuff. Uh, ready for this? Yeah. So this is our first <laughs> one of where we're all doing stuff together. It is a song uh, that I wrote uh, seven years ago? Seven? Eight years ago? I don't know. But I'd yeah. never heard it like this until the other day when we were in my car and everybody started joining in. It was quite wonderful. And uh, um, yeah, it, it hopefully it sounds wonderful today. We, we don't know. Uh, it won't be this, um, Bob. It won't be this, can you um, no, go on here? Sure. No. Recreate that magic we had the other day, Carl. You're ruining it. <laughs> what chords? What chords? Yeah. A minor. Yeah. B minor. And then in the two chords, this is. Same old song, the same old refrain, so he 
he sang out of time in a different key. This gone to tune, but wild and free. The people they shove him the passes by as they turn their heads in children's eyes. as uh, the start of Jack and Ori, and um, several other significant things happened in that year, one of which we're going to come to now in this story. It's called Liverpool, 1965, a cosmic conundrum. Is anyone here from Liverpool? No. Okay, well, I'll just change that now, so I'm not joking. Uh, hopefully you will still find this interesting. You're probably still aware of the incredible impact which Liverpool has had on the music we listen to. And even maybe the way we view the world. And perhaps this all started back in the midst of time during that hazy, blurry decade of decadence, hopes and dreams the 1960s. In fact, right in the middle of that decade, 1965. It was then that Allen Ginsberg, the late American beat poet, visited Liverpool in May 1965 as a friend of Bob Dylan, who was doing his infamous UK tour at that time. Ginsberg made this announcement. This is what he said. At the present moment, Liverpool is the centre of consciousness of the human spirit. That was his exact words. I'd like you all to remember those words, as they're very important to the story I'm about to tell you. In fact, to help ensure that you remember it would be a good idea to say these words together, out loud, together. So please repeat after me. At the present moment. At the present moment. Liverpool is the centre of consciousness. Liverpool is the centre of consciousness. Of the human spirit. Of the human spirit. It's brilliant. At this point, someone says brilliant. That's it, sorry. <laughs> it's interesting to reflect on what was happening in Liverpool in May 1965. Four things immediately spring to mind. One, Liverpool won the FA Cup for the first time, beating Leeds 2-1 with Ian Callaghan doing a right wing cross to my boyhood hero Ian St John, who threw himself at it at a flying header into the net for the winner. Number two, the Beatles, as usual, 
Ticket to Ride was number one in the hit parade. Remember the hit parade? Whatever happens to the hit parade. Number three, the aforementioned Dylan was playing at the Liverpool Odeon on the 1st of May, 1965. And four, Harold Wilson, MP for Houghton in Liverpool, was Prime Minister. With Labour having ended 13 years of Tory rule just five months earlier. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, what we appear to have here, I'm sure you've noticed, it's a glorious cosmic alignment of football, music, and politics. So, perhaps Ginsburg was right that Liverpool may well have been the centre of consciousness of the human spirit. Does anyone get any views on that, by the way? No? Well, I'll tell you what, I thought you might say that. I'm not saying that. So we're going to pause there to discuss this proposition. So if you could turn to your neighbour for the next five minutes and then we'll report back and discuss it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm only joking, it's okay. Uh, but you see, I didn't have any views on what Ginsburg claimed either. Not really. Or rather, I did have an opinion. But I thought I'd better check it out with someone who knew a thing or two about consciousness. Someone whose opinions I really would value. Now please bear in mind that this, I wrote this seven years ago, when the person concerned was still very much alive. I decided to contact Leonard Cohen, as he was someone whose songs and poems I truly loved. So as you can imagine, Leonard's opinion on whether Liverpool in May 1965 was the centre of consciousness of the human spirit was something which I would value. Well, sort of value. As I thought further about whether he would have the answer, I began to have my doubts. A cosmic alignment of football, music and politics. Clearly, Leonard, although primarily a poet at the time, had written, sung and played some wonderful, mysterious songs. Yes, his thoughts on music would certainly be helpful. What about politics? Well, although he was mainly concerned with the human condition, he did, rather late in the day, promote peace in the Middle East. Although initially playing songs with the Israeli army in 1973, in 2009 he returned to Israel to play a show billed as a concert for reconciliation, <coughs> tolerance and peace, donating the proceeds to groups working to promote peace between Israelis and Palestinians. And of course he wrote Democracy and the Future, with the latter's words still so potent today. Everybody knows that the war is over. Everybody knows that the good guys lost. Everybody knows that the fight was fixed. The poor stay poor and the rich get rich, that's how it goes, everybody knows. So it would seem that Leonard would have valuable things to say on both music and politics. But what did he know about football? As far as I could tell, he hadn't made any pronouncements in football of any kind at the Premier League or otherwise. And hadn't said anything or written any poems about sport, although, as a young boy in Montreal, he did make the school ice hockey team, but that doesn't really count. Would Leonard's lack of knowledge of football devalue his opinion on whether Liverpool in May 1965 was the centre of consciousness of the human spirit? I decided on balance no, and would go ahead and contact him. Now, at this point, it's important to remind you that this was seven years ago, when Leonard was still alive and in fact was more popular than ever, having just celebrated his 80th birthday and had launched his then new album entitled, in true Leonard style, Popular Problems. But how best <laughs> to contact him? I couldn't envisage him being available to speak to on the phone and didn't think he was into emails or Facebook. I just couldn't see that. But maybe. I could try texting him. Now this is when it gets interesting. You were wondering when it was going to get interesting to you. <laughs> this is the thing. 
At this point, you might wonder how I got hold of Leonard's mobile phone number. And I'm sorry to disappoint this guy, remember? I checked my mobile phone and found the name Leonard in my list of contact numbers. I've only ever personally known one Leonard, and he was a scaffolder who helped install my solar panels. So, was this Leonard him? Or could it be Leonard Cohen? If it was Leonard the scaffolder, how would he react to receiving my text message asking for his views on whether Liverpool in May 1965 was the centre of consciousness of the human spirit? He would probably consider me mad, but he wouldn't be unhappy. So I decided to send the text and hoped it might be to the right Leonard. A month passed, no reply. Then amazingly I got a response and from the right Leonard. And this is what he wrote. He asked me to thank everyone for their good wishes on his 80th birthday. Which I have to say confused me because I hadn't said anything about that at all. And then unbelievably, he wrote on the subject on whether Allen Ginsberg was right about Liverpool. And this is what he said. He reminded me of the chorus of his great song anthem, that we all should ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering, there's a crack, a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in. Now, while appreciating the beauty of those words, I texted back Leonard asking him what relevance they had on the Liverpool question. His reply came back instantly. He suggested I spend a few years up a mountain and then it would all become clear. <laughs> Thanks, Leonard. That's really helpful, I texted back. But with climate change and everything else going on in the world today, I just don't have the spare time. I waited for his reply, but ran out of battery. And then he's gone. And I'll never know his views on the Liverpool question. But I suspect he would have agreed with Ginsburg. We'll never know for sure, except that on his final album, released three years after his death, if you listen very, very carefully to the third verse of his seventh song, you will hear Leonard quietly utter the word, yes. Which I personally understand to be a message from the grave, an answer to the Ginsberg question, and that we can all now, with some certainty, I agree that Liverpool in the 19th May of the album was the centre of consciousness of the human spirit. But as this is all just a made up story, we'll probably never know for sure. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. And we will and Carl. Big hand, please. Om Shanti Om Shanti Om Shanti 
I should be right in this sun. This old Harley that's been ridden, sun kissed and aged before the falling sky. Oh.